Right, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the PCOM Power. Um, my name is Sheila Lakey and I'm uh, an Improvement Manager with PCOM's programme for the NHS in Britain. This is the second PCOM Power, um, the second of five that we've set up for the Pathfinder sites to share their learning. Um, we have eight Pathfinders. So for those of you that weren't at the last session, we have eight Pathfinder sites and you can see them here hopefully. Um, we have Great Ormond Street uh, doing a project around PCOMs um, for psychological interventions uh, for children. We have another project at Great Ormond Street that's focusing on childhood feeding disorders. Uh, Guys in St. Thomas's have developed an animated PCOM for hospital inpatient children. Olga Hay in Liverpool are working on PCOMs for children with chronic illness. And in Nottingham, they are working um, on PCOMs for children and young people admitted to hospital for self-harm injuries and eating disorders. Then we have uh, Univers University Hospital Bristol, who we will hear from today with Dr. Nikki Harris, um, for, regarding PCOMs for children receiving palliative care. Then there's the North of England, CSU, which is looking at young people and families living with asthma. And then lastly, we have Swapsus TTG, looking at children and young people who use wheelchair and posture services. So now today, we were hoping to have Daniela Hurst from Great Ormond Street talking about their work, uh, but unfortunately, she isn't able to join us today. Um, but we do have Dr. Harris, from the rest of England, um, and also our expert speaker is Zoe Porter, who is the National Delivery Lead for Integrated Personal Commissioning um, within NHS England. We'll hear both presentations first, and um, then there'll be an opportunity for you to ask any questions that you have. So here's hoping to a really good uh, stimulating discussion. Okay, so let's begin. Um, Nikki, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you today about patient centre outcome measures for children and young people with palliative care needs. When I first became interested in this sort of work, I was medical director of our local children's hospice. And when I started there, one of the issues that we had was how do we know if anything that we're doing is getting it right for the people that we're trying to help. How do we know we're making a difference? How do we know we've made a good job? And um, we thought about this for, hang on, let me just get on to my next slide. We thought about this for some time, and in a way, if you're thinking about the outcomes for palliative care, the thing to think about is quality of life. But actually, the devil's in the detail with that because how do you define it and how do you measure it? And the nature of the challenge becomes more obvious when you then start to unpick what's involved. So that on an individual patient level, you're looking at multiple comorbidities and often accumulating more of them over time as death is approaching. And when you're looking in the sort of over a longer term, you will have a deteriorating baseline of health very often. So that what might be an acceptable outcome now would have been unthinkably unacceptable perhaps a few weeks or months ago. Um, and there's a changing perception of a new normal. So how do you then have outcome measurement that fits with such a flexible um, set of um, expectations? We also wanted to be able to incorporate the holistic nature of palliative care, so bringing in aspects of physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual, and so on, all of those dimensions, and wanted to be able to do that in a way that followed the patient, because the children and families that we look after don't spend all their time in the hospice. They have lives to live, and if you're really looking at their quality of life, it has to work uh, or has to be improved wherever they are, not just when they're in the hospice. The other thing is that children don't come to us in single units. They come as part of a family. So as well as thinking about the child, we need to think about the parents, the siblings, wider family members and community and so on, because we do aim to improve the quality of life and look after all of the people who are affected by that child's imminent death. 
when we talked about outcome measures with some of our fellow providers, we had great interest from them in terms of they would like to know that they're making a difference. But actually for each provider, they very often had relatively small numbers of children or families involved and a very diverse population. So you're not comparing like with like very often. So all of that made it quite difficult to think about how you're going to get an outcome measure for all of that. Um, and we thought and we thought and then we just decided to turn it on its head and actually ask the patient or, and, and their families, what matters to you? So rather than trying to prescribe what might matter, just ask them, what matters to you? And the result of the work that we've been doing is that we've come up with a system that we call My Quality. It allows patients and their families or carers to identify, describe, prioritize, and monitor their own health problems and the impact that that has on their, on their quality of life. We call these patient-generated outcome measures rather than patient-centered outcome measures because they're actually defined and determined by the individuals themselves. But there is some discussion at the moment about the best um, wording for this because we have PCOMs, PGOMs, PDOMs, etc. But the concept is that these are patient-generated outcome measures. And the basics behind the system is that it is web-based. It's easy to use, it's free, it's secure, and its fundamental difference to a lot of the other things that are out there is that it is controlled by the patients and carers, and it's not controlled by the professionals supporting them. This is their choice of what they decide um, as their outcomes and what they might choose to um, work with us about. Because it's web-based, it has the advantages of modern technology, so it can be highly interactive. People can use it in a personal way um, uh, and can personalize it and use it, for instance, with a free text bit and use it as a daily diary. There is real-time input. I'll show you some pictures in a minute so that you can look at longitudinal change and you can analyze the interactions between causative factors, the cumulative symptom burden, and so on. We've also incorporated a social media model of communication between the individuals and their chosen professional support teams so that much like with Facebook, if they decide they want to share some information with you, that's fine, otherwise they can cut you off. It is truly patient controlled. This is what it looks like. The basics are that anywhere where you can get internet access on a smartphone or a tablet or whatever, you can, get, you can log on to this system and it's free for personal users and for their health and social care professionals. The picture that you can see on the right hand side of this screen is the instruction sheet that we give to families and essentially we talk about five steps. And it all starts with a conversation, step number one, thinking about identifying your priorities. And when we're thinking about quality of life, we ask people to consider what is it that stops me or our family from doing what we'd like to do today? What is it that we can work together to improve that will have a positive impact on quality of life? And it might be that these are physical symptoms. It might be something to do with the emotional and social impact of, of illness. But the most important thing for both of these is this section called Make Your Own because it allows people to put in free text and to make this personal for them. Once people have identified their priorities, we ask them to describe what that means to them. There's a default position of a Likert scale, but people can use free text again to make this personal and relevant so that this example on the right-hand side shows the input from a family who's um, little boy had cerebral palsy and they've shown descriptions of how they know he has a day when he is free of pain versus when it's absolutely terrible. And in fact, this process gives great insight to what's the best that people can imagine things would be and what's the worst that they can imagine things would be and where is normal for them. So it's actually a very productive exercise even if they only get this far in the system because the conversations that you are having are helping to, to improve understanding, manage expectation, um, and you can work together to work out really where a family is with this journey as their child is deteriorating and potentially will die. On a day-to-day -day basis, you, um, having set up your priorities, you use the slidey scales and you just move the numbers across the like the um, faces change and this print here represents what was put on your scale on the, 
on the previous slide. As you put that in, there's also a daily diary section at the bottom, and then in real time, um, you will get a graph showing changes over time. The diary notes appear on the side, um, and you can then play around with that to look for associations, longitudinal change, and so on. And then you can decide as an individual whether you wish to share your information or keep it completely private. And you can, and many do, keep it completely private and choose not to share with healthcare or social care professionals. Others choose to share with some of the professionals who are registered on the system, and they can log in and see the graphs and the daily diary comments, but they cannot change any information there. It's the, remember, the control is with the individual user. And then as part of this outcome measures project, we've also introduced another tier, which allows anonymized uh, data collection. So in this example from a dietitian's, for instance, so that they can see the feedback from a variety of users. So who uses it and why? Well, this isn't a brand new concept. We've been working on this since 2011 at the Children's Hospice. Um, and when we last looked at our numbers, we had 256 registered users, approximately two-thirds personal users and one-third practitioner. Our longest user has been having almost daily input for more than, well, it's about two and a half years now. The families who use this within our children's hospice service, because of the catchment that we serve, tend to be parents of children who have severe neurodisability. So in practice, it has been the parents putting things in rather than the children themselves because of the nature of the conditions that we look after. We did, however, feel that that wasn't so different from when we'd see people in clinics and so on because we would be talking to the parents about their children. So um, we feel that this is a valid way to use this information within a consultation setting. We do, however, recognize that it doesn't directly collect information from the children themselves within the context of, our, of its use within a children's hospice. In 2013-14, we had funding from the Health Foundation to do a formal evaluation, and I'm not going to go through all of that today, um, but if you're interested, the work has been accepted for publication in archives and will be out shortly. However, there are a few highlighted uh, results that I would like to share with you. We invited 33 families to take part, 32 took us up on the offer. That's a group of 32 families identified 114 priorities between them, usually two or three, but in one case, up to 15 separate parameters that they were recording. And that family did record things on a daily basis for more than a month. But as I say, mostly it was two or three parameters each. And given our neurodisability population, the most common were seizures and then constipation or pain or sleep problems. Now, when we were doing our work with the PCOMS uh, project, we did a number of focus groups about using this process as an outcome measurement rather than as an individual symptomatic symptom tracker, essentially. And one of the fathers said, well, there you go. There's your outcome measures. You've got seizures, constipation, pain, sleep problems. Tick, done. There you go. Set up your scales and Bob's your uncle. And the woman next to him said, my daughter hasn't got seizures. I would not fill in something like that. I don't want to be reminded that she doesn't have seizures. I don't want to feel guilty. I don't want the results to be skewed. And it comes back to the issues about if you want an outcome measure that people will use, it has got to be relevant and meaningful to them. Otherwise, it becomes at best a chore and perhaps an insult. This sentiment was backed up when we looked at the um, web use habits of people who used the website in our early study. And although, remember, we had those drop-down lists of all the priorities, well, actually, in a third of them, people were modifying those with free text to make them relevant to them. And the scales were personalized in more than half of the cases. So I think one of the lessons we learned from that is if you're going to do outcome measurement that depends on individuals putting those in, it has got to be meaningful and relevant and sensitive to their needs. And if we get that wrong, we're not going to get the outcome measurements that will help clinical care. This is a, a picture, it's difficult to read on this screen, I take it, but this sums up the feedback that we had from the people within our 
hospice study about what they liked about my quality system. And there were four main areas. The first was that it was user friendly. They liked the fact that it was quick and easy, they could do it faster than the adverts on the telly, and it stopped them doing other things such as keeping scraps of paper in an A4 book and then trying to work out what happened before. So it makes their lives easier and actually from a medical point of view, when you can get at that information, it made my life easier too. They found it empowering. They said they felt safer, they felt more confident, they had a greater understanding of what was going on. We found many examples where it was clinically relevant, where you either stopped doing something that wasn't working, or you could, because you had a better understanding of what was causing an effect, you were more directly able to tackle symptoms appropriately. Um, and, and could make more effective use of resu your resources as a result. But the thing that came over most was the fact that it was person-centered care. And they liked the fact that they could tell their story, that people could listen to that and pick that, pick that up, particularly from looking at the graphic display, and could see the difference that that was making to the consultation process and to the interaction between the individual families and the clinical staff. So, just to wrap those, um, that study up in general, we found that with our interviews with patients and families that they had a greater understanding of the needs and priorities for care, that they felt empowered, and this wasn't just their language. We confirmed this with family empowerment scales, which did increase um, across all the domains that were being measured in terms of both caring for their child as an individual, but also their role with clinicians and the role as members of, of as proactive members of the community. There was an improved safety through better sharing of information and there was more timely provision of support when children and families were struggling because the system will generate email alerts to professionals if some of the symptom parameters, for instance, go above the preset levels. They liked the fact that they could use it in any location. And in fact, of our 32 families, there were some who stopped using it early. And most of the time, it was because the hardest place to use this was in hospital, because very often there are those poor telephone signal or Wi-Fi black holes, and they couldn't use it. And then they got out of the habit. But the remainder of them who were being remaining either at home or in a hospice where they had more of their normal routine, continued to use this for well beyond the three-month period of our initial study. So they liked the fact they could use it anywhere, and they liked the fact that they could bring in all key providers um, to view their data if they felt that that was relevant. We didn't do a formal assessment of benefit of providers, but from our discussions with them informally in the early study and then through this PCOM work, providers clearly want to have a greater understanding of their needs and of the patient's needs and priorities. And when working with empowered patients and carers, they could see the impact that that would have on collaborative decision making. They liked the fact that interventions could be safer, that there's timely provision of support, and can also see the potential for more efficient use of resources and to use the information provided to improve the evidence base of the effective interventions for um, children's palliative care. And we must admit, it, what we currently do does have a rather weak evidence base in, um, in many aspects, and we would like to improve that. Both of those bottom two are areas for work in the future. However, we haven't by any means got this cracked. There are lots of challenges in the future when you're thinking about outcome measures for children's palliative care. When we're thinking about introducing my quality, we need to recognize it's not a passive process. Both for the patient and family users and for the practitioners who are using it, they need to develop new ways of working and new ways of working together. And although the families have taken this on board rather more easily than the practitioners, if the practitioners don't endorse this, then actually for the families trying to tell their story, it's like they may as well be talking to a blank wall. I do recognize, though, that in a time of 
an NHS which is under great challenge and has had a lot of change, that asking people to do something in a new way is quite difficult. So we need to think about ways to see the benefits and sell the benefits of this sort of approach to make care more patient-centered and at the same time have the benefits of knowing that as a provider that you're doing the right things for your families and that um, on a direct clinical level you can make your job easier as well. The second area that's a challenge is getting the balance right between, when you're thinking about outcome measurement, between individualized patient-centered outcome measures versus more collective measures that we use for populations for research and service development. And we wanted to be, very much protect the patient-centered, patient-controlled ethos of what we're doing. And it may be that the way to get that balance right is to come away from the concept of outcome measures being outcomes of symptoms, but thinking about the process that's involved. And that if the outcome is to have more patient-centered care, then perhaps providers, CCGs, whatever, need to be thinking about examples of proving that you're delivering good patient-centered care um, and being able to show perhaps more process measures that involve this at this point rather than specific symptom-related outcomes themselves. This is an area which I'm sure there will be further debate about, but getting that balance right between the individualized versus the collective outcome measure is key. And I think particularly for our example, if you have patient-generated outcome measures, if you don't get it right for the individuals, they won't be generating you any data anyway. So you may as well um, not bother. If we, if we get this right for families, for patients and families to use, we can then use their data to improve patient care in the longer term. And the third area is that we've been talking about this from a health perspective, but of course if you're really thinking in a patient-centered way, they have multiple providers who need to work together to improve outcomes for each child and family. And we haven't really begun to think about how we roll this out in other dimensions of supportive care, but that's a very important area to think about for the future. So I've given you plenty to think about, and I would be happy to answer questions later on in this debate, but at this point, I will stop there and hand the ball back to Sheila um, as we will continue. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Nikki. A really good example there. Um, and also of asking patients what matter to them instead of describing what might matter to them, I thought was another really good point. Um, some really interesting challenges raised there um, and lots of food for thought for people to think about. Right, so I'm going to move on now and um, hand over to Zoe so that we can hear about the Integrated Personal Commissioning Programme. So thank you. That was really interesting, and I think what I'm about to talk about is is different in a number of significant ways, but has at its core that same question: what matters to you, alongside what is the matter with you, and um, the idea of, of trying then to um, improve our health and care system so that we can um, respond better to that and, and provide better support for people and, and therefore better outcomes. I'm going to talk for um, a short while about integrated personal commissioning. I'll do a little little bit of background and then I'll, I'll get into the what is it, who's it for, who's doing it, um, and, and a little bit about where we're up to. And, and then I'd be really interested to have a, a kind of conversation to uh, do any kind of queries or comments that, that you have. So um, I don't think it says on this slide, but my name is Zoe Porter. My job is to organise um, delivery support for this Integrated Personal Commissioning Programme, which is essentially a demonstrator programme for, for personal health budgets across the country. So we're supporting the NHS to, to introduce them in, in uh, particular areas at the moment. Um, so I'll start with um, kind of what's the problem we're trying to solve. And I think there's, there's multiple problems that we're trying to solve. But from the NHS's point of view, um, we know that there are an increasing number of people who are living every day with with long-term conditions and also increasingly people living with a, a complexity in their lives around multiple long-term conditions. Um, and that this, um, this uses up a lot of our money, which is scarce, and there's a sense that, that we could do something better, that, that um, our services as they are, which are, are, are very well designed around um, identifying and fixing um, individual um, uh, 
uh, diseases or, or conditions aren't, aren't necessarily well, well configured to, um, to design really good effective support around, around people who, who are living with a, a condition that, that can't easily be fixed and also potentially um, uh, living with a c complexity around, around their, um, their health condition or, or disability. So this is provides us an opportunity with, with thinking a bit differently and, and trying some different ways of working. And, and, and from the point of view of integrated personal commissioning, some, some of the new ways that we're, we're seeking to, um, to, to kind of start this new way um, of working are, are based on um, a, a number of different kind of ideas that have a lot in common. So the social model of disability, which has been around for uh, I think 30 or 40 years around seeing people, um, disabled people, not as um, conditions to be fixed, but as, as, as people who are, are trying to live the same, same lives we're all trying to live, um, and where there's barriers um, that, that, that are around them that the society puts in the way that, that we can help people overcome in order to live a good life. Around um, co-production, around real, genuinely working with people as uh, um, people who use our services as, as people have something to offer themselves where we can co-design and potentially co-produce and deliver um, better um, solutions to some of the, the challenges in their life. Um, Personalisation and self-directed support, which has been a, a kind of response to the social care system um, around, around these challenges, which is around the um, uh, putting people at the centre of planning processes and giving them more control over the, the support. And then also coming up through health, a way to focus on supporting people themselves to um, understand, get confident and, and manage their um, and manage their day-to-day -day, um, health conditions and equipping them with the, the tools and the, the confidence that they might need to do that. So, so, uh, so these are some of the ideas that are playing into um, into uh, integrated personal commissioning, and, and you'll know that um, there, are, there are so many um, new initiatives at the moment, vanguards and new models of care and so on, and I think one of the things that's um, particular to integrated personal commissioning is that we're looking at the, the, same, um, the same kind of problem and, and trying to reach them as the same solutions, but rather than starting with a reconsideration of, of systems we're starting with a different relationship with people themselves and um, a partnership with them that, that enables us to kind of build upward um, a new system of support and care. It doesn't mean that there won't, that won't entail um, money being spent differently and, and services and systems looking different, but we're starting um, with people um, themselves as, as uh, the building block of some of that um, change. So there's a there's a kind of a recognition I think that the um, the, the system that we have um, around us has, has served us really well and is is something to be uh, massively proud of, but that um, that that it kind of needs updating from the point of view of um, some of the traditional ways of providing support to people, some of the traditional relationships between experts and patients who are who are done unto um, and 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 around kind of different physical and mental health conditions in people's lives and being able to, to see people as a whole and to design support around them as a whole. So uh, coming to, to what we're actually talking about, so integrated personal commissioning was announced um, last year by Simon Stevens at a, a local government association conference as an initiative across health and social care that would put people in the driving seat of being able to um, uh, design the support that they might want. Um, and it comes alongside a number of initiatives um, that are very linked to this, such as um, personal budgets, which are a core part of IPC, but we're trying to look at a system as a whole and look at what it would take to be, um, to be um, uh, provide a, a person-centred system as a whole. Um, so it includes personal budgets, but it's more than more than just that, and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in coming slides. So, when we invited areas to um, join the programme, we, um, we we kind of indicated that 
um, we saw uh, this kind of approach working particularly well for people with the most complex needs. So there were a number of groups of people that we kind of indicated we'd like to have um, interest in from, from local areas about, about how they might want to um, work with those groups and with local voluntary sector organisations to design something different. So children and young people with complex needs, uh, people who, who have multiple long-term conditions, uh, people with learning disabilities, particularly those at risk of institutionalisation, and, and people with significant mental health needs. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about which of those groups we've actually actually got in the program. So the, what we're trying to um, achieve with this is, is kind of multiple, so something for everybody. So we're trying to design support and systems that will give people and their families a better life and will allow them to achieve outcomes around their health and, and their everyday living that are important to them um, as well as important to the system through um, much greater involvement in their care and, and being able to, to really um, have much more say of the design of, of that support. So it really, really could be tailored to their individual needs and the circumstances around them. Um, we're looking to try to um, achieve uh, prevention of the kind of crises in people's lives um, that, that can hit any of us, but um, that in some people's cases with some prior planning, some better support around them can be avoided or can be responded to much better. Um, and then we're best trying to overall um, provide a, a more seamless experience of um, care across the different organisations and agencies that, that people might have in their lives. So this, um, this next slide is really to, to kind of ask a question and, and, and to, to, to start a conversation around if we were to start with individual people and ask them what matters to you as well as kind of what's the matter with you that, that, that we need to respond to, what, what might look different around that if we were genuinely able to build up from um, lots of conversations and um, aggregate what, what people really um, saw and, and needed in their lives um, as, as really effective in, in terms of healthcare as well as some of the kind of common sense solutions that they might be able to come to that might look less like traditional health and, and social care. So what would that look like? And we don't, that's one of the questions that we're trying to answer through having these conversations with lots of people through um, integrated personal commissioning. Uh, we have a little bit of insight into what that might look like for different groups of people. So say for example, in Northamptonshire, as part of the personal health budget pilot programme, they sat down with people who were using um, a lot of mental health um, services and looked at all those different services, the different interactions they had with um, different clinicians, plus maybe social care support, and, and had a, a conversation between the person um, on the receiving end of that and um, a clinician who knew them well, an open, honest conversation around okay, well, well, that stuff's important, that's to keep you safe, that's what, that's what we need, um, and I think we need to agree that that, that stuff stays, stays the same, those particular interactions with um, clinicians. But are there some areas that we think actually we're, we're not achieving what we want to be with that? So if your CPN is coming around to your house every fortnight, um, they, they're, they're having a cup of tea and they're having a chat with you, um, but, but is there something, are there any interactions that you're having with the health and social care system at the minute that if the resource for that was used differently, you could do something different? And um, for kind of relatively small groups of people, so they're, they're just into kind of their tens, the kind of um, decisions that, that people make through that conversation usually feed up a proportion of that support, so um, less than a third of it and deployed into much more um, holistic ways of, of supporting them. So things like people um, uh, who were struggling uh, when their mental health got particularly bad with, with thoughts that, that then kept them awake all night and, and spiralled into, um, spiralled into um, them getting iller and iller. Um, so one guy called Ricky um, bought a cinema, a cinema kind of season ticket that meant he could go any time he wanted 
and, and just being able to take that control at that time, go and sit in front of something that took his mind off those thoughts. Um, he said he saw every single film that there was and, and, and seen all the good, bad and the ugly of, of everything that, that Hollywood has produced. But it, it just was a solution that he came to that turned out to really work for him. It might not have done. Um, wasn't expensive, um, uh, you know, less than 100 quid a, a year, I think. But as part of his overall care plan meant that he needed less input from other people and also meant that he was able to manage his mental health and use less use of crisis services. So these kind of solutions and this balance of traditional support versus um, something that might look a little bit different will be different in everybody's case. But how do we take that, um, uh, how do we have those conversations with people so that we can start to build up a, um, health and social care support for, for people with really complex needs that, um, that, that's really effective for them and, and make the most of the, the scarce resources that there are. So, picking on. So, for integrated personal commissioning, we've been going now since April in terms of sites being live and we're kind of, um, it's, it's a quite a difficult, um, it, it, it was trying to do so much across a whole system. And I think it's taken us um, quite a while to um, be, be able to get our heads around the, the, the kind of one, the, the kind of model, what it looks like, how you can chunk it up to start to make something different happen. So the um, the, the, the way that we're we're sort of conceptualising it at the moment across the site is is um, written up in this arrow here. Um, so what sites are trying to do is they're looking at their cohort of people, and I've, I've got a later slide that tells you who, who the different cohorts are, um, and looking at um, spend across um, all of the health and social care interactions for those individual people. Well, that's what they're trying to do. So anybody who's ever been involved in trying to um, get person uh, level data and, and connect it across health and social care will, will know that that's not a quick task. But what they're trying to do is really understand across the whole system, so all the health um, support that people might get in social care, who's, who's using what, what does that look like, how much are they using crisis services in A&E, and, and how much uh, are we spending in different areas, in order to, to kind of start to try to identify the right people where we could do something better for them, um, plus also have a conversation, so to be able to approach people where we think there's potential to do something better. Um, we're also building on a, a whole raft of uh, community and peer support um, approaches in order to, there's a, there's a real focus on investing in those in order to be able to um, connect people up with, with low level support and support from other people, like minded people that can really help get them um, connected back into their communities where they've become isolated and build up their kind of social capital and also connect it into um, places where they might get more support around managing their day-to-day -day lives and day-to-day -day conditions. And we have a care planning conversation with people that, that um, it does genuinely start with um, what's important to you as well as, as, well as what's important um, for you in terms of your health. So it begins to look at, um, uh, explore with people their lives, what's really important, what's really happened for them, what's worked, what, ha what isn't working for them at the moment, and start to think differently about what might be possible. Then comes the potential, either individually or I guess aggregated for lots of people, where you start to, to hear what, what would work best for people, of um, a, a change in where the resources start to go. So most obviously that would be where people were eligible for and, and there was real benefit in them getting a personal budget, so that might be social care, personal budget funding, or it might also be a personal health budget, and obviously it might be um, a bit of both, forty to one budget. So where there's real benefit for people, um, a personal budget approach that will allow people to make something different happen, um, because it's all very well having a conversation about possibilities, but until, uh, but where actually you need uh, um, some resource to make something different happen, um, that that, that kind of, um, it sometimes can feel like it, it might not have to. And then at the, the kind of the last box of this is a, a more population level thing. So where we take the, the learning about what really could work better for people and, and start to um, develop the market to be able to respond to that. Um, and, and hopefully shift 
um, some funding out of areas of health and social care that weren't um, uh, achieving outcomes for people into areas, areas that could. That's the overall very um, complex task that the IPC sites are uh, uh, a challenge with, is trying to introduce at the moment. Um, so we've got nine sites and they, they vary massively in um, scope and scale. So the South West is almost every CCG and every local authority and, and numerous voluntary sector organisations um, versus Luton, which is kind of uh, its population as a city is 230,000 and they're working just with one um, cohort, people with dementia, which is a little over a thousand there. So a whole range of different areas and geographies to, to test some of this stuff out. Um, so here you can see where we ended up with. Um, these are some of the first groups of people that people will be working with. Some of them will then move on to an, another cohort of people in the second and third year. Um, and we have, um, uh, so we have a, a bit of a range across those areas that we're hoping to get bids in from. Where we're a little bit weaker beyond people with dementia um, is um, people using mental health services. I think we'd like to kind of come back to that later. That they are included within some of these groups, but it's not a strong, a strong focus of this program that it, as it could have been. Um, so we'll be working over the next three years or so, and what we hope to do is um, do work in the with these demonstrator sites and led by these demonstrator sites and, and local people in them to really define the different components that we saw in that slide earlier with the, with the kind of arrow in the middle of um, integrated personal commissioning and really um, nail down some of the critical questions around that and that the how do you do it and how do you really make it work so that other areas can, can take and, and adapt that, that learning. So we, we are tasked with developing a number of standard practical models and um, as, as far as we can, we, we will be trying to do that across the programme. Um, but obviously, there'll be a, a, a broad range of kind of expertise that will develop through learning how to do this, through the kind of blind alleys we go down and, and the, the um, areas we alight upon where we make real progress. Um, and um, we'll be picking that up kind of um, through ongoing learning that we hope to begin to share next year. Um, with the um, with um, other other areas, plus um, the collection of um, local metrics that we're supporting all sites to put in place, but uh, a national evaluation which will which will kind of start in earnest in in the next year or so. Um, I guess we'll also have people who've been there and done it, some people with direct experience of of being on the receiving end of of um, uh, health and care services to. To clinicians and, and, and leaders who can and share and, and help um, others understand um, what the potential of this could be. Um, and that includes kind of stories and so on. We'll probably, I'm sure, have identified a number of kind of uh, legislative and policy barriers that get in the way. So IG is one that we're um, uh, addressing on a daily basis, but there will be more as, as we really get into the meat of this. So um, we'll hope to. to be able to learn what those are in order to be able to take something forward nationally on those. And then, um, should this be successful and be um, kind of politically adopted, then um, I guess we'll, we'll have um, the ability to put in place a, a support programme for other areas to, to take it up. So that's the um, that's some bulks of my conversation, really. When um, Simon Stevens, the, the NHS England Chief Exec, talks about this. He talks in terms of a kind of revolution, um, but also in terms of um, really making the most of the potential and energy that, that people and families um, have themselves and, and um, really harnessing that for the future of, of the NHS. That was a really interesting presentation and some obvious, really clear links with person-centred outcomes. Um, I really like the poster. I think that's fantastic. Um, and uh, I love the way that you said it's rather than reconfiguring systems, it's about changing the relationship that professionals have with people um, and starting to develop partnerships with people. So it's really great. Thank you. So we have about 10 minutes left now um, for questions. Um, I can see that we have one question in the chat box at the moment um, from Fliss. Uh, yes, so um, 
I think the role of advocacy in integrated personal commissioning would particularly um, it'd probably be helpful for, for everybody that we're working with. We've got um, one of the challenges we set ourselves is to design a system that that works for everybody and um, that, that isn't um, just reliant on people coming into the system with an ability to be articulate and to um, and to kind of take control. So we're doing that through a, a number of ways, and one of the key ones is a really strong um, partnership with the voluntary sector in, in every site. So um, particularly for um, some of our cohorts, so people with learning disabilities um, and um, you know people with dementia, there are um, youth-led organisations, um, also local organisations like Age UK and Alzheimer's Society and so on. Um, working really strongly alongside the programme to co-design the programme so it works for everybody, but also to think through what support will people need, whether that's advocacy support or, um, or, or whatever it takes when people don't have people around them who can, who can play that role naturally for them. So it will be an important part of the, the, the design of, of this. Um, uh, for people, I think, definitely. Thank you. So does anyone else have any more questions? Either for Nikki or Joey. Yeah, I've got a question. Um, I was very interested in the IPC presentation, um, particularly some of the examples on that lovely poster. For instance, you know, that if I go to regular yoga, I will have less anxiety and therefore I will see less of my doctor. What I wasn't clear about is how much evidence is there at the moment or how are you collecting evidence for the future that those will necessarily follow in turn, that, for instance, resource use will go down um, with some of these interventions. I was interested to know how you're going to approach that aspect of um, the implementation of um, IPC. Yeah, excellent question. So um, the, the actual poster I nicked from um, the personal health budget pilot at the end, these were some of the, the kind of the uses of personal health budgets that people had made. Now, clearly, uh, um, what automatically gets picked up and, and is particularly highlighted in the picture are the sort of the more alternative and the more non-conventional ways that people uh, choose. Um, I think. And, and the personal health budget pilot program showed overall that people um, made less use of unplanned healthcare services and were in hospital slightly less than, than the control groups that ran alongside it. So overall, the approach of people um, uh, having more say over over what um, they used to keep them well um, was kind of shown to work. But that doesn't mean that individual interventions always do. So at an individual level, it's, it's usually a decision made and signed off by a health professional. So people that, that there's usually a kind of um, a conversation around, okay, well, there might not be a load of randomised control trial evidence on that one, but between us and understanding your situation and understanding your circumstances, we, we can agree um, as a, oh, I can agree as a health professional that that's worth a go and certainly it's better than it might provide better outcomes than there are at the moment. And then across the program we'll be, if, if when we manage to, if say if, if when we manage to actually um, create these patient linked data sets, we'll be able to track people's use of, um, of, of health and social care services. So we'll be able to see if um, an intervention, a different kind of uh, approach to somebody's healthcare did result in them pitching up at the, the GP left. Um, and we'll also be um, having other kind of metrics in place to, to measure people's outcomes. And then there should be, and it's just been designed at the moment, uh, a kind of a robust, more traditional evaluation that should um, look overall at, at some of these questions and, and kind of track people. Um, so I think we're, we're trying to, we're always kind of mindful of the individual decision um, that might make sense for people and then the overall approach of giving people choice and control and whether that, um, mm. and whether that actually does, is better value for resource and does, and does overall have the outcomes for people. Mm. I hope that makes some sense. Yes, it does. Thank you. Because essentially there is a bit of a, um, a tension almost in a way between the personalised 
um, care, the self-management agenda, the participant patients that we talk about, and respecting the fact that people tend to have expertise in their own lives and healthcare and whatever, versus the need for an evidence-based health care and all the difficult decisions that have to be made because it's um yeah no absolutely it's a really live debate it's live all over twitter and all over social media um and i i guess um some of the, the kind of stuff that hits the headlines so we hit the headlines with personal health budgets um in september didn't we with pictures of uh, pedalos and um summer mm. houses everywhere um weren't overly helpful in that debate as they polarised it a lot but, but a lot of what people choose is is quite common sense so that so the summer house I'm fairly sure I don't have the details of that person but I'm fairly sure it won't have been a, a, a kind of gazebo in someone's garden it would have been a family with um, a young person with very complex needs um, and you know quite often um, autism and so on that mm. needed a quiet space for that person to go or or for some time out or to do some stuff away from the, the noisy environment and, and that would have been the conversation um, that would have led to the agreement of, of some of their um, care package money being spent on, on, on something like that um, as opposed to the person ending up in residential care because the family couldn't cope. So it, it, um, it, it's kind of approaching this from an individual point of view and making sure that there's nothing harmful or there's no evidence that a certain approach would be detrimental to people and then where things aren't working and people are at risk of um, their um, family or community situation breaking down kind of taking a little bit of a, uh, an approach that says maybe we don't seem to be doing awful well, awfully well at the moment the approaches don't seem to be effective at the moment what can we try that might be good? Different, uh, different where there might not be the, the same level of evidence but um, but but kind of as a as a health professional uh, we we might agree that, that something different would be worth a worth a try but it is it, I'm sure it'll continue to be a, a very active area for the debate and 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 so it should be um, if, if we're using NHS funding thank you Thanks, Zoe. Um, there's another question from Fliss for Nikki, um, and uh, she is asking if it's possible to aggregate data from my quality into cohort or population level data, um, or is it not possible because it's too personalised? Um, right. Um, yes, I'm just reading it. Um, thank you for your kind comments, Fliss. Is it possible to aggregate the data into cohort or population level data? You could, but our numbers aren't big enough at the moment, so we have a very diverse population of users. So it would not be a sensible statistical thing to do as it stands at the moment. In the future, yes, there is potential to do that. However, it has to be given used with a few caveats. We've talked about one caveat being that it's very personalized data so that People can, for instance, set where their normal is, but when you look at the differing levels of the scales and the descriptors of the symptoms and where they are from their normal, you would have to think very carefully about how you um, collate that, that data. The second thing is that you have to remember in patient-generated data that you do have a self-selected group and they are selecting what they share to you. And we know from some of our users that actually they liked the system enough to set up more than one account so that they might share, for instance, the physical symptoms but might choose to keep private the mental health aspects or things about their relationship or other bits and pieces that they felt they did not want publicly. So you're not even necessarily getting the full holistic picture. That doesn't mean you can't use the data that you can see, but it does mean that you need to be careful about extrapolating from a self-selected group of contributors and self-selected um, fields of information um, when you're then trying to analyze, analyze that data and extrapolate to something bigger. So I think it does have potential, and particularly in rare conditions where you may find only a few, for instance, uh, one of the projects I'm doing is with a group of families who have a rare metabolic condition and they felt they all wanted to know more about what 
interventions worked for some of the symptoms that they had in their condition. And so you may well be able to use that to move the evidence base forward, but I think it'll be, um, it, it, it's a proceed with caution sort of advice. And um, in the future, I would love to be able to explore that area in more detail because I think there is potential, but at the moment it's a move forward with caution. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Right, well, we've run out of time now. So thank you once again to all our speakers and to all of you for joining us today. All the slides from today will be available on the NHSIQ website. Um, so lastly, I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas, and thank you very much for joining us once again. Goodbye.